Good morning. All right, if you, and uh, let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. And also, if you would like to have any notes, uh, please raise your hand and the ushers will get them to you. And uh, for those who are online, the notes are also available and online. All right, just keep your hands up. Also, before we uh, jump in, uh, traditionally on Saturdays in the prayer room, the, um, it's uh, kind of slim, <laughs> and uh, our worship teams are, are full on those days, and, uh, and it would be a real, uh, just a real encouragement to them just to have some warm bodies uh, joining them in worship and in prayer, and so I just want to uh, just encourage this, uh, we need a couple of hundred of you, a hundred of you just to pray and ask the Lord just to uh, come for one set on a Saturday, you know, anytime, you know, you can come in the mornings, afternoons, evenings, night watches, whatever works for you. But just to, just to pray and, and see if the Lord would just give you a window uh, on Saturday. And, and Sundays. Saturdays and Sundays. Weekends, there you go. <laughs> and uh, just to come and, and join the, the teams and just to worship the Lord. Again, just take a set or so and uh, just want to put that before you guys. All right, uh, Revelation 22. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your son and the cross, Lord, and the way that uh, he provided for us, Father, to interact with you, Lord, to, to know you, to partner with you, to experience your presence. Father, I ask you, Lord, this morning, Lord, that you would open up our eyes uh, to your law. Lord, that you would touch our spirit, Lord, with your Desire and your longing, Father, to draw near to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in uh, March, uh, we went, and most of you know, we went on 40 days of, of just a focus seeking the Lord. And, uh, and during that time, uh, one of the things that the Lord really just uh, surprised us with and, and energized our conversations with was the, was the subject of the, uh, of the Laodicea and the Spirit in the Church of Laodicea. But the, the invitation to that church, and really as the way of overcoming this later scene spirit, which is not what we're talking about this morning, is, the, is verse 20, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where the Lord invites his people to, uh, to come and to dine with him. And it was also during that time, if you recall, that uh, the Lord uh, gave uh, Mike this, this open vision of the, of the door, this door of glory, and and the Lord basically, essentially promising us to, to release grace upon our hearts, to, uh, to open up our hearts to him in a greater way, and to, to fellowship with him uh, 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 by the grace of God. And during that time, one of the passages that uh, was highlighted was John chapter 13 to 17. That John chapter 13 to 17 was one of the primary passages the to, uh, to grow in and to understand for us to experience that door of grace, uh, so to speak, that Revelation 3.20 was, was talking about. And so uh, the way I like to think of it, the Lord initiated, so to speak, a conversation uh, with our spiritual family, but we also found out since then that there were other leaders across the body of Christ that the Lord was highlighting John 13 to 17 to them and so it's kind of a bit of a tip-off that the Lord is actually having this conversation uh, with the body of Christ as, at large to say, hey, I've got these five chapters, and there is, uh, there's much insight that, um, uh, that I want to give uh, to the church to equip our hearts to walk in intimacy, in love, and in power, even as the days unfold. And so a part of my goal this morning is just to kind of uh, continue to put that conversation in front of us to kind of catch us up on the conversation. Uh, over the last uh, six months, uh, Mike has been teaching on this subject on Friday nights, and uh, uh, lots of great insights, and we got them all on, uh, on the website. Uh, but thirdly, to also kind of put before us again, the, what is the core uh, reality of this message. What is the, what is the, I mean, there's many, many things, but if you were to kind of just distill it down to the main point, is that Jesus is putting before us the privilege that we have in our faith as believers to have a deep interaction and deep intimacy with the Trinity. 
that we have the privilege to enter by the grace of God into the family dynamic between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that we get to enter into the interaction that uh, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have with each other. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, here's what he says. He says, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That is what our fellowship is. It is fundamentally connected to our interaction with the Father and the Son as they are interacting with each other. It's, it's a vast, vast subject. A paragraph B, the primary destiny and inheritance of the church um, is to experience deep intimacy uh, with the Lord. You know, I think that um, uh, as I've been uh, in the Lord for the last 30 years, there's more and more believers that are getting convinced of that, but there's still all too many that believe that intimacy is with the Lord, the deep things of the Lord is reserved only for a chosen few. And beloved, it, there, it, there's nothing further from the truth that every believer has the invitation, has the destiny and the inheritance of of deep interaction with the Lord where, where we experience the Lord's presence and his power and his love and his wisdom and grace and all the things available to us that we experience those things on a deep level uh, in our spirit, not only that we experience them at a deep level in our spirit, but that we have the grace to express them to those that are around us. And so we are called into deep uh, spiritual union uh, uh, with God. That is really our calling. You know, I think of uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse uh, 15 to 60, one of my favorite passages, where the Apostle Paul makes a very surprising statement about his calling. And when we think about an apostle, we would think that he would say, you know, my calling is to build these many churches, or my calling is to walk in this dimension of power, or my calling is to, uh, is to have uh, this amount of impact insofar as my leadership is. But Paul actually doesn't say that. He says a very, very surprising thing in Galatians 1.15. And I believe that what the statement that he's making as an apostle who is really a witness and a pattern uh, for the church in his generation is that what he's saying about himself, I believe is true for every believer. And here's what he says. He says that it pleased God who called him from his mother's womb. So he's talking about his calling. He says, the reason for why I was formed and shaped in my mother's womb is for this reason, is that the father would reveal his son in Paul. He says, that is the primary reason for why I was formed and fashioned in my mother's womb is that for all the days of my life, to live a life in such a way, to position myself in such a way that the Father would do what the Father enjoys doing the most, and that is making known the glory and the beauty of his Son inside Paul's spirit. And I believe that that is for us. Now, yes, there are uh, many assignments that we have in all kinds of different ways and according to the gifts and the talents that the Lord has given us and so forth. And so I don't, don't want to minimize that, but I do want to put before us that there is this thing called, called to have Christ revealed on the inside. Called to experience a deep spiritual union. And that is what the Lord puts uh, before us in John 13 to 17. I personally cannot think of a portion of scripture that is more focused in a high concentrate way on the subject of experiencing deep spiritual union with God. A paragraph C, a Jesus tells us in that, that the purpose of the instruction is to, uh, is to help believers walk in victory in the, in the context of growing global pressure. He instructs his disciples that as we dialogue with the Lord, that our hearts get filled with peace, joy, and keep us from crumbling, from falling away under pressure. Paragraph D, the upper room discourse is what uh, it is uh, commonly known as. John 13 to 17 is commonly known as the upper room discourse. It, it's a blueprint 
or a pattern and, and a map and a pathway uh, to the glory and the destiny of the church. Uh, John 17 is, is the climax of these uh, five chapters where we see the glory and the destiny of the church, what it is that God has fully in store for the body of Christ insofar as unity with one another, insofar as the experience of our relationship with the Father and the Son, insofar as the love expressed to one another, the love received from God and the love expressed back to God. Now in paragraph E, uh, Jesus prophesied of a coming, a time of great pressure on the earth. And I, and I intentionally say Jesus prophesied. He didn't just mention it. He didn't just teach it. He, he spoke prophetically about great, great, great pressure coming on the earth. Now, unfortunately, uh, there are some that um, <laughs> uh, live in denial of this fact. And... Uh, and are, and are experiencing deep elements of grief. And when, when I look at the culture today, and when I look at the comments that I hear uh, uh, across the body of Christ just in different ways, it's, it is as though currently we're experiencing the five stages of grief. And what is, what's been happening in the last four years, and in particular in the last year and a half, it's, it's got us a little discombobulated, and there's this range of emotions that people are experiencing. But I think if you look at the five stages of grief, which won't we'll cover them, you can see those emotions manifesting um, all throughout the culture, but in particular in the body of Christ, which is what we're talking about this morning. Great pressure. And one of the reasons why... Uh, we have these uh, uh, different internal responses is because it, what it's doing, it is actually showing us that there is more to be had insofar as our experience in God through prayer. There, there is more to be had insofar as our experience in God in prayer. That's what the internal Alarms, these internal signs, these inward disturbances, they are indicators to us that there's more. There's, there's actually more uh, joy and peace and love and righteousness to, that is available to us uh, uh, by the grace of God as we experience uh, uh, this union uh, uh, with the Lord. The second thing is that it shows us is that there is a, there, that our perspective is insufficient. That the perspective that we have, uh, whatever uh, 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 culture we're from, whatever uh, political persuasion we have, whatever nation we belong to, that our perspective is insufficient and that there is a greater perspective that the Lord actually wants to give to us. In Jeremiah uh, 23 verse 20, uh, it makes a, a very powerful promise uh, for the body of Christ. But the Lord says that in the last days that there will be a people who will have perfect or mature understanding of the thoughts and the intents of God's heart. And so the experience of God's presence in union that impacts our spirit and transforms our emotions and the growing understanding of the narrative of God called the gospel, it reorients our thinking and it prepares us to, uh, to walk out the storm that lies before us. I want to give us something to think about. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, familiar passage. It says, even youth uh, shall, um, uh, uh, shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. The the context there in, in Isaiah 40 really is talking about a time of great crisis, that there's coming a crisis in the earth that's so great that even the strength of youthful resilience will not be able to withstand the growing tide of pressure. And then, of course, in verse 31, 
The Lord then gets a promise, says, but those who wait on the Lord. And that's really what John 13 and 17 is about. It's about equipping our hearts to wait on the Lord. And he says that those who live that life are waiting, or the way that Paul says it, live a life where the Father reveals Christ in us. Uh, uh, we can say, well, so we can call it uh, the, the revealing of Christ in us. We can call it waiting on the Lord. We can call it gazing on the beauty. We can call it setting our minds to the things above. Whatever phrase you want to use, they're all saying the same thing, that we want, to, uh, we want to experience the grace of God on our spirit. And he says that those who set themselves uh, on that mission to respond to that calling, as says they will have renewed strength they will have their spirit that will soar like eagles. It says they will run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. But the verse before, what is interesting, it's contrasted with the verse before, that even young people, the pressure will be so great that with all their youthful idealism, youthful zeal, youthful resilience, they will cave under the pressure. Even young people, unless they do, verse 31. And here's some, here's some, a few data points about 2020. 2020, I believe, showed us the initial signs of the deterioration of youthful zeal. In 2020, a larger number, this is paragraph F, a larger number than average amount of young adults, so from ages 18 to 24, reported signs of anxiety and depressive disorder, to 56%. And here's the interesting thing. is compared to all adults, young adults were more likely to report substance abuse use and, and between 25% of young adults to 13% of adults and suicidal thoughts as well. And I, and I believe that this is an indicator of what, that, uh, where things are heading. This is an indicator of where things are heading insofar as the impact of what global, uh, global pressure will have on young people. And this is referring to 2020. This is referring to the impact of the, uh, uh, of the pandemic. Just the, the, the emotional impact. And again, and I just, I go, Lord, I said, this is brilliant. I mean, not only did you speak it, you know, three, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, you gave us John 13 to 17. And just within the last 12 months, you've begun to stir the body of Christ across the nation, undoubtedly across the nations of the world, to say, hey, John 13 to 17 is a roadmap, and it is a pathway, and it's a model of, and it's an invitation of deep intimacy and union with God that will actually cause us to stand in the, in, uh, in, in the context of the coming pressure. Page two. The seal of God's divine love. Song of Solomon 8, uh, 6 and 7, familiar passage again, one that the Lord has highlighted um, in our midst uh, 40 years ago, I think it was. And uh, where it talks about God's presence manifested upon our hearts like fire. And it is a fire uh, so strong that not even water can extinguish that fire. And this, these waters, I believe, speaks of sin, temptation, pressures of, of all kinds. In other words, there is, uh, there's an increase of darkness, an increase of pressure, and yet, in the grace of God, there's a seal of love, of divine fire, that God wants to uh, 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 release upon the heart of every believer. And that our invitation in the grace of God is to cultivate that fire, is to cultivate that flame, uh, so to speak. Paragraph A, in these five chapters, John 13 and 17, Jesus equips us to walk in love, even in troubling circumstances. In other words, he, he equips us to, uh, to walk in love even in the midst of troubling waters, using Song of Solomon um, as, a, 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 as an example. He equips our hearts to, to walk in love uh, towards God, walking in love, receiving love from God, and extending love to those that are around us. Now, John 13 to 17 specifically highlights 
um, at least three uh, uh, pressures. It highlights the issue of betrayal in John 13. It highlights the issue of disappointment in John 14. And it highlights the issue of, uh, of persecution. Now, these three pressures, and Jesus in John 13 to 17 is uh, seeking to convince uh, the body of Christ that the love of God that is available to us is so strong and it's so powerful that these three things cannot snuff out that love in our hearts. But we want to come before him and cultivate that love be, uh, uh, before him. Now the thing that's so amazing, paragraph C, is that John 13 and 17, Jesus, he envisions and calls the church and he equips the church to engage with God in order to, fu- uh, to fully experience the five components of love. We'll look at them in just a moment. But here's how we engage the Lord. We engage them through the expression of gratitude and for the request of more insight. That's the, that's the real, real thing that uh, we want to walk away with this morning. That it is as simple as the expression of gratitude and the request for more insight. It, the, the phrase that uh, uh, Mike has taught us, thank you, you, show me more. Thank you, show me more. And we can do it as long or as, or as short, and we can do it as much or as little as we want to. But notice that according to the measure that we give ourselves to this engagement, there is a, a significantly and an abounding uh, corresponding response from God as we engage him in this way. Simply, Father, thank you for this truth. Show me more. Father, thank you that you love your son. Show me more. Father, thank you that your son loves me as much as as you love him. Show me more. It is literally that simple of speaking those phrases to the Lord. And we can speak them to the Lord in a, uh, uh, on Sundays during the times of worship. And the Christian, don't just enjoy the music. I mean, just take, you know, in a 30-minute window, say it a couple times, Lord, thank you, show me more. We can do thank you, show me more in the car. We can do thank you, show me more as we're walking out uh, to, the car, to the door. We can say thank you, show me more in the midst of the conversation. With, with someone. We can, we, it is literally that simple, and I just, I'm just so grateful to the Lord that it truly is that simple. Simply engaging him with gratitude and the request for more insight. Now, um, there are five uh, components of love, I believe, that are seen in John 13 to 17. One is the revelation of God's love for God. Secondly, the revelation or the understanding of God's love for us. Thirdly, the understanding of God's love in us towards him. And it's quite amazing, John 17, 26, literally tells us that the love that the end time church will display towards God is the exact same love that God has displayed towards her. Fourthly, God's love in us towards one another and fifth, it's God's love in us for a hostile world in the context of the gospel witness. Now, on the, on the rest of the notes, I'm not going to cover this, but basically it's to kind of help us kind of catch up on the conversation where the last six months we started, and now we're actually in John 14. And so this is a real brief little outline on John 13 to 14 just to help you out um, if, you, uh, if you're interested in looking at them. Let's go to page three. Page three. You know, one of the core messages of John 13 uh, to 17 is the experiencing of deep a spiritual union with the Lord or uh, a, a, a spiritual union or intimacy with the Lord where we can experience him in a very, very deep way by the Holy Spirit. By the way, that is one of the questions that Jesus is answering in John 14 to the disciples. They're going, hey, you're leaving, so, so, so what does this mean in terms of our engagement with God? And Jesus says, he, he says, you have no idea 
uh, what it is that I'm about to do on that cross and what it is and what it is that's going to be purchased for you insofar as your interaction with me and my Father. The grace of God, Christ who is our life. You know, John 14, 6, you know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, again, it's so true to these five chapters. I mean, every line, sometimes every phrase, sometimes a word, I mean, it's just layered with implications in terms of what Jesus is saying there. In fact, when Jesus says that I am the life, I mean, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I mean, just the life alone, the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, in Colossians chapter 3, and Romans chapter 6 expounds on great detail of what it means for Jesus to be our life. And so when we think about Jesus being, because we're so accustomed to using this verse in the context of evangelism, and that is for sure appropriate, that, that, that Jesus is the bridge, you know, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Do you want to accept Jesus? Yes, amen, let's move on. And there is, and you know, how, how many of us are grateful for that truth? That's what brought us into these chairs, right? So I'm so grateful for it, but... I want to say that Jesus is saying a whole lot more than simply giving an invitation to eternal life. He is saying something in terms of an experiential reality that will be made available to us. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 3, Romans chapter 6, and other passages, there's many more, uh, actually expounds on the implications of what it means for Jesus to be our life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, for instance, Paul says this, I've been crucified with Christ. I, uh, it is I no longer live, sorry, it's I no longer who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. In other words, there's an exchange that has taken place. Paul saying that I have ceased to live by my own source. And there is a whole other source, the very life of God that has entered in me. And the life I now live in the natural, in the day-to-day, in all my interactions as an apostle, as a leader, as a brother, as a father. I mean, whatever the roles are in my life, I live that according to an entirely different source. And it's the very life of God in me because Christ is our life. Life, the concept of life, it's a very abstract concept. But here is the... Partially what it means, what the meaning of life is. It means to possess or having the ability and the capacity to function, to change. Is there a paragraph A? To show growth, uh, to sustain, or to be productive. That's what it means. So when, when there's life, there's change. So when there's life, there's sustenance. When there's life, there's growth. When there's life, there's change. When there's life, there is productivity. And so life is experienced in our physical life. We were born into this world um, uh, 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 in this physical life, but the scripture tells us that though we were physically alive, we were dead in our spirit, which means that our, which means that our spirit, there was no change in our spiritual life. There was no growth in our spiritual life. Uh, there was no productivity that came from our spiritual life. And by productivity, meaning uh, a productivity that actually counts before the judgment seat. He says, we were dead in our trespasses, Paul says. And so through the born-again experience, we were made alive. The very life of God entered into our spirit. So now we can change, be transformed, be sustained, have productivity, and so forth. It is one of the most uh, neglected and, I believe, least emphasized truths uh, in the body of Christ today. And I don't say that with any um, animosity or, oh, or anything like that. I'm just saying it with a sense of going, wow, I mean, do we understand what it is that we have available to us, what has been made available to us when you and I became born again? The very life of God became our life. That is the grace of God. The life of God in us is the grace of God. The grace of God is both his, you know, the whole issue of the unmerited favor, 
but it also has power in us to be changed, to be sustained, to be productive in a way that actually counts before the throne of grace in the age to come. The most glorious and often neglected truth is, uh, and one of these least emphasized and expounded upon truths is the subject of our spiritual union with God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It, it's, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, he rebuked the Pharisees on, on many, many occasions, and he kind of challenged the doctrine and whatnot, but it's only one place that I can think of where he really called uh, 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 someone's teaching ministry into question, and it was in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and it was over this issue. He says, Nicodemus, he says, unless you're born again, unless the life of God enters into you, you can't enter into my kingdom, and Nicodemus goes, what do you mean? They got to go back to their mother's womb and come back out. And Jesus goes, he goes, and you're a theologian in Israel and you don't get this? He goes, Nicodemus, this is huge. What I'm telling you right here, this is massive. This will lead all of Israel and the nations of the earth into the fullness of the promise of God made through Abraham. This is massive what I'm telling you. And so of all the subjects that are getting talked about, we need to continue talking about the subject. But I believe that what the Lord has started in the body of Christ in this hour is going to increase the conversation related to this issue of our union with God, the life of God being in us to the born-again experience. In fact, what is interesting is in John 14, Verse 26, Jesus talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says. The Holy Spirit will teach you concerning these things, and he will remind you concerning these things. I believe that is the primary thing that the Spirit will do insofar as bringing to us the understanding of Christ is coming alongside us to teach us and to instruct us about the wealth that is available to us insofar as our intimate union with God. But, but you know what? Here's the funny thing. I just had a bunch of words. Here's the takeaway point. Father, thank you. Show me more. Thank you. Show me more. And we will even experience, thing in our, experience things in our spirit that are beyond words. So it's not even about the words. I'm putting before us the grandeur of what it is available to us, and I'm doing a really poor job at it, but I know this, that it's as simple as this. Father, thank you. Show me more. Paragraph D. The Spirit is eagerly awaiting at the door for our engagement. I mean, he's, the Holy Spirit is ready to engage us on the subject matter. It's what James says in James 4. Here's how James said it. He says, or do you think the scripture says in vain that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? The spirit in us, he is eager. He goes, just start talking to me. He goes, I will give you greater grace is what he says next. Verse 6. There is more grace. There is uh, in other words, it's saying there's more of the experience of life uh, that he has available for us. In other words, it's say it differently. He says, if you're stuck in the mud with bitterness and lust, he said the spirit is eager to give more grace. In fact, that is the context of what he's talking about. He's talking about bitterness. He's talking about ambition. He's talking about lust there in John, uh, James 3 and 4. And he says, look, he says, you don't have to be intimidated by feeling locked up. We all know that feeling. He says, you need to know this. Because of union, the Spirit is in you. And he says, he is jealously, he's eager, ready to engage the conversation. So here's what he says. He said, he wants to give more grace. That's the promise. So here's what we do. He says, He says uh, that we're to humble ourselves, number one. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that's a problem. <laughs> number two, he says, we're to submit to God. You're like, Ugh. resist the devil. You're like, ah. So he's telling us three things to do. He goes, humble yourself, resist, resist the devil, and submit. All three things that we are so eager to do. 
These things don't come natural to us, don't they? He goes, resist the devil. You're like, oh, I got to do that too? You're like, oh, man, this is a long list. And, I, and here's what I think he's saying in verse 8. He goes, no, actually, here's how you submit, resist, and, uh, and humble yourself. Here's how you do it. Ready for it? Verse 8, draw near. Thank you. Show me more. Thank you. Show me more. Enter into that engagement. And he says, when you do that, God will draw near to you. And guess when God draws near, guess who flees? And so the resisting, the humbling, the, uh, 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 the, the submitting happens. The more we engage in the simple conversation, thank you, show me more. And beloved, it works for everything. It, it ne- in my personal life, and I, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to say this, but I'm just kind of saying it as a testimony. This is not a rule. But I find that when I don't do thank you, show me more. When I grit teeth, buckle up, use the strength of my personality, trying to use my determination, it's a long day. Sorry, sometimes it's a long week. <laughs> But when I do thank you, show me more, it never ceases to amaze me how quickly he engages my heart. And there's, there's a flow that begins to happen on the inside. There's a, just a little adjustment of the, of the perspective. And I'm like, Lord, I only did it for 30 seconds. He goes, yeah. He goes, imagine if, what would happen if you did it more. I'm like, oh, I think I'm starting to get it. One last thing. Page four. This has massive implications for uh, the end time church. Revelation chapter two, verse 17. Finally, we got there. He says, and the spirit and the bride say come. Let him who hears say come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Lots to be said about this passage, but I just want to point out two uh, uh, quick things. Number one, the spirit and the bride say come. It's, it's the, I believe what this verse is telling us is that the church is going to come to a, a mature understanding of what it means to be in union with the spirit and to live out this, uh, this agreement and to experience the deep things of God upon our spirit. And that in this union that we would experience, and again, there's lots to be said about it, but, but for our context today, we would experience the uh, Psalm 36, 8, the rivers of his delight, where we begin to experience spiritual pleasures deep on the inside, which translates into the experience of love, righteousness, wisdom, grace, mercy, and many, many more things. We, we begin to experience those things in our spirit. And so number one, the church... Is saying, uh, he's saying that the church will come into the place of agreement where it is the spirit and the bride speaking together in union and in agreement. The second thing I want to highlight is that uh, uh, Revelation 22, verse 17 is pointing back to Isaiah 55. For those of you taking notes, Isaiah 55. And Isaiah 55 is a glorious passage about the mercy of God made available to us. And I think that what is happening here in Revelation 22, 17, it is the spirit and the bride, the church being a mature understanding of her union with God, number one. Number two, she has experienced the, the satisfying mercy of God in such a um, intense way that thirdly, here, here, this might surprise you, that in the midst of the darkest generation in history, we're talking seals, trumpets, and bowls, his uh, generation, that generation, the church will have so tasted of the mercy of God, they will stand in front of that generation like Jesus stood in front of the woman at the well and says, come and drink of the water of life. Come and drink of the water of life. 
And this will have massive implications insofar as of understanding how to proclaim the gospel in the midst of the releasing of the seals, trumpets, and the bowls. John 7, 37, that just like Jesus stood in front of a generation and said, come, all you are thirsty and drink of the water of life, the end time church will stand in front of the end time generation because she's experienced deep union with God and says, come, come to him. His, his, his mercy is available to you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Father, thank you, Lord, even uh, today, the Reformation uh, 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 Sunday, the celebrating, Lord, the, uh, the, the beginning of the Reformation, uh, that the just shall live by faith. Lord, the simplicity of the access, Father, that we have available to you. Let's let the worship team come up. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would show us more of what is available to us by the Holy Spirit in us. Thank you, Lord, that we are in you. You are in us, Jesus, and that you are in the Father. Thank you. Show us more. Show us more, Father, concerning the waters of life that live inside of us. Show us more concerning this union with you. Father, open up our eyes to John 13 to 17 that we may see glorious, marvelous, wonderful things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Beloved, this is good news. God is our life. The holy, majestic, transcendent, all powerful God has taken residence in us by the Holy Spirit. And He is our source, He is our life. Let's just worship the Lord. invite you to come to the front. You want prayer for more insight to this subject? Do someone to agree with you? Or you feel stuck in your heart?